You have your finger right in front of the camera. Okay, what do I do now? Turn it off? Yeah. Hi there. I guess we're, but we're filming from home today. It's so cold out and we're doing a Zoom service. But uh, we're still going to give the message today. We're in James. We're 16th message in James. And we're talking about the riches and the woes of the wealthy. Um, our, our psalm that the Lord gave us 33 years ago for Bentley is um, in this area. It says, Psalm 125, verse 1 to 5. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. From this time forth, forevermore. The scepter, or the authority of wickedness, will not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside into their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evildoers. Peace be on Israel. May God add his blessing to the promises of his word that we declare over this community. As we were studying the book of James, we were looking at the greatest key in, to Christianity and a number of keys. All about relationships which are created or lost through attitudes. Our attitude, our attitudes are created or recreated by our understanding of who we are, where we are, what we are, why we are, and when we are. Proverbs 18.24 says, a man who has friends must make himself friendly. Oh yeah, I have to remember to slow down. As my dad always said, don't talk so fast. Proverbs 19.4, wealth attracts many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Dr. Ralph Ryback uh, has talked about, and he's taught at many institutions, including the Harvard Medical School. He talks about people who don't need to stay around us and how we they make us feel. You know, people that you may not want to hang out with. Uh, a relationship in which we feel, the first is the critic. And that's a relationship in which we feel judged, criticized no matter what we do. Criticism is different than advice, and it's important to understand the difference. Often critical people, judgmental people, think that they are giving advice. The second, uh, the five uh, people that it's not fun to be around, is the passive aggressive. Passive aggression is the passion expressed in, of anger. We all know people who are passive aggressive, where we never know what message such a person is trying to convey. We may feel that we are always walking on eggshells when we were around the passive aggressive person. Denial of feelings, sarcasm, backhanded compliments, are sure ways to tell that someone is a passive aggressive. The third is a narcissist. The narcissist acts like he or she is God's gift to the universe, knows everything, is best at everything, is not afraid to tell us so. And no matter how smart we are, we can never measure up to this person. Narcissism is considered a personality disorder and it is toxic. The fourth is the stonewaller. Stonewalling refers to the act of refusing communication to evade the issue. Many people may have heard of a stonewaller, a person who refuses to engage in conversation or share feelings when these important issues come up. This often makes the other person feel insignificant and unworthy of honest communication. The stonewaller may come off as cold and refuse to admit there is a problem, but refusing to communicate creates negative feelings and barriers that make it difficult to further successful to a further successful relationship. The last one is the antisocial personality. Antisocial personality disorder is ASPD uh, includes the traits of sociopathy, thought to result from social conditions such as childhood abuse, and characterized by explosive and sometimes violent behavior but still presumed to possess the capability for empathy and remorse. And psychopathy, uh, feeling no remorse or empathy, taking advantage of others legally, and often involved in fraud or other white-collar crimes. The varying motivations include greed and revenge. 
So as we look at the teaching and the advice in James, he covers all these things in these areas in practical ways, examples and illustrations. Two weeks ago, we talked about judging others and how it destroys relationships with God and with man. James 4.11 says, Do not speak evil about one another, brothers. The one who speaks against his brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Do as I say, not as I do, they say. Um, this week we listened to a senator giving a tremendous argument on why a former president should not be impeached. The reasons after reason after reason with lots of emotion. Uh, it made sense, called out for a better attitude, um, that, that the country would gather together and we need to listen to them. Realizing that it was wrong to come down in such a, with such harsh judgment, a call to demonstrate the higher level of leadership and, and why it was just wrong to act with impeachment, why personal actions do not call for removal, on and on an impassioned call to stop the mistaken road of impeaching a president. Wow, wow, wow. Stop and desist in the trip written and you're, the road you're heading down. This was written in 1999 by Senator Chuck Schumer at the trial of Bill Clinton. The American people have saved us from, our, from ourselves. He's now demanding that the President Donald Trump be impeached. And so we see it's not what we say, it's what we do and how we live. So what he made an amazing speech to a while ago, now he's doing exactly the opposite. So we look in, uh, in James 4 and 12, it says, there's only one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? So we go on in the um, text in James, and it was talked about last week about boasting about tomorrow. Verse 13, come now you say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a uh, town, spend a year there and trade and make a profit, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, he said in verse 15, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting, he says, is evil. Verse 17, so whoever knows the right things to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. What we look at submitting ourselves to the Lord, we've looked at um, resisting the enemy and they've looked at two kinds of wisdom and we've looked at jealousy, envy, selfish ambition, conflict and, and we look at treating the rich better than the poor. And so in this today we, we follow along there's a call for people uh, to consider one another. Uh, the call has just gone out yesterday and, and well, Saturday when I'm recording this and, and uh, will be over, over the night and over this weekend. Uh, for people to watch out for their neighbors in this cold snap. 60, pe 60 people have used the free transit, transit, two transit dedicated routes to get people, where, to keep them out of the cold and get them to help. And they've opened Trinity Lutheran Church, Al Rashid Mos Mosque, and the Edmonton Convention Center. Uh, for people to come in out of the cold, the freezing cold, to sleep. And so we see it's about considering one another. Uh, most people that would listen to the news, they have no care because they have warmth and we have the fireplace going behind me. It's nice and warm and we're so thankful for it. Uh, but here's freezing people. So in the mosque they've opened 30, 72 places for people to sleep. The Mustard Seed Ministry has opened a third shelter at Trinity Lutheran for 40 more people. And the Tipuan shelter at the convention center is up to their, their ability to house 350 people in need. Helping those in need. That's what it's all about. And if we have ability to do it, and it says if we don't do it, to, that, to us that is sin. We're in a time when the rich were getting richer. Pandemic has brought in over a trillion dollars to gain of gain for some of the wealthy large businesses. Well, tens of thousands of businesses feel they are living in the dirty 30s and it's all over. There they're going to, to, trying to survive. Back in the dirty 30s, men rode the trains across our country to try and find work anywhere just to survive. 
But the scripture says that we are in a day when in Luke chapter 12, verse 26, men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. We read it in the Darby translation, it says, men ready to die through fear and expectation of what is coming on the inhabitable earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So as we look at the differences of the rich and the poor, it, we're, we're not looking at the differences just of the rich and the poor, but we're looking at the rich that hold on to what they have. But not everybody that's had lots of money has done that. And I think of the story of R.G. Letourneau. He was a leading advocate of a high-speed, high-capacity, mobile, earth-moving uh, machinery back in the 20s. And his numerous inventions spearheaded that concept. He uh, learned and faced some very difficult times and prayed and sought God and got ideas of how to create some of the great earth moving machines. He was a believer that had the ideas of the Lord that helped him and with the greatest, greatest machines that the world has seen. During the war, I think almost 50% of the, of the machines that were being used were from his, his company. But after brief retirement, he developed a new, and he sold his company, he sold it to, it's owned by now called Kumatsu. But he uh, decided to create some more things. So he, after a bit of retirement, he came up with new machines with electric wheel motors and invented them uh, by him. And I, I remember working, uh, hauling out of the mine, Copper Valley, uh, Highland Valley Copper Mine, and uh, those big machines have these huge diesel engines and those diesel, diesel engines, uh, as the, the black smoke pours out of them, are simply running the, the, the generators that are running the electric wheel motors. And uh, so Al Letourneau uh, was a very um, godly man, and he created the Letourneau University. It's a Christ-centered, interdenominational institute of higher learning, offering more than 85 undergraduate and graduate degree programs in arts and sciences, aviation, business, technology, education, engineering, nursing, psychology and counseling, and theology and vocation. And so he took his wealth and he invested it in helping other people. Point is, he started off giving one-tenth of his wealth and ended up by giving 90% of, of his wealth to the kingdom of God and to others. Uh, Laterno served both uh, Wikipedia says, Laterno served both God and humanity by setting aside 90% of his salary and company profits for God and living on the other 10%. And so we see, you can have wealth, and there's many um, uh, T. Eaton and uh, different companies um, that started off and uh, were very much to giving and helping others. So it, it's not money that's the problem, it's the love of money. So we read in... Um, Matthew 6 and 33, and he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The issue we face when we're dealing with the, the riches and the woes of the wealthy is when we're seeking the wealth. When the wealth and, uh, and having and holding and hoarding becomes, becomes more important than sharing and caring. What a blessing to have and to be able to share. But looking at the negative side, of seeking wealth, the warning to the rich, and that comes back to the scripture we're reading this week, James chapter five, starting verse one, and it's kind of kind of a bummer when you when you hear what they have to say. Come now, you rich. Now remember, these are the rich that are hoarding. You rich, weep and howl for the miseries that you that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence you and you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up your treasures in the last days. Wow, what a contrast to trusting the Lord, trusting in what then to trusting in wealth. Trusting in the Lord in giving, sharing, or hoarding. So Matthew uh, 19 gives us a story and Jesus is explaining here. Uh, it's called the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, 16 to 29. And someone came to him and said, teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you want to enter the life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, 
Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, pretty proud, I think, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said, if you want to be complete, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. Well, that's a tough one because he was following, he's got everything, and uh, he was following that. He said, come and follow me. Verse 22, it says, but when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And so here we see the woes and the of, of the wealthy when the wealth has them. Here we see the value of seeking goods. Matthew 6, 19, in the New International says, um, 6, 19 to 21, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin tear and destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what we're talking about here is dealing with the riches and woes of, of the wealthy. It's all about a matter of where your heart is. So James spells it out. He talks about, um, um, you know, like, how do, we, how do we deal with this? He spells it out. He talks about uh, a God-ordained impe impeachment, if you want to put it that way. In verse 4, he says, Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived in this earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter, and you have conde condemned and murdered the righteous person, and he does not resist you. So what do we see here is that God keeps the real books. There are books being kept, and they're kept by God. There is coming a day and a time, we're told, and we're explained, it was explained this way, the Holy Ghost and God's angels are the keepers of the archives, archives, archives of heaven. There are five specific books or volumes of books that represent all human accounts that are preserved for eternity. The only facts that are removed from those books are sins that have been forgiven and removed by the blood of Christ. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's removed. He said, as far as this, the east is from the west, so far as he's taken and hidden our, our failures, our flaws, our sin. Men and women who die in their sins have their names vanished and are never, and are never remembered. And so we see the differences of dying in, with the forgiveness of God or dying in our own selfishness. These books begin with all our bodily members recorded before we were conceived in our mother's womb. They start to write the, write the story from even before we were conceived. That's amazing and that really speaks volumes about taking lives uh, because a book is started, a chapter in the book is started right from the moment that God has foreseen us and then we we're conceived and it's been written down in the book. They conclude with a single book called the Book of Life where the name of every redeemed soul is recorded. Oh, that we be in the book of life. And we get into the book of life by confessing our need for God and accepting his salvation, the price that Jesus paid, and inviting him into our lives. And um, we come into the book of life. Matthew 7 tells us in verse 13 about what the struggles are. He said in verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Then he goes on to say in verse 15, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes and thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? And this is a key thing here. Uh, we're not to be judged, but, but, but people explain, uh, you know, reveal their lives by their fruit. By their fruit you shall know them. 
And he tells it, he said, uh, likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And then he goes on to talk about true and false disciples. Not everyone, verse 21, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Why? Because they were wrapped up in themselves. It's not money that is the root of evil. It is the love of money. Verse 24, he talked about the wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them to practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat across the house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. The wise man builds on the solid rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains came down, the same rains, stream rose and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. The key was where we were built. Are we built on the word of God? Are we built on faith in God? Or are we built on our own wisdom, our own understanding, and our own money? When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of the law. And so we see through the full word of God, it's not about riches. It's, um, it's not about what we, what we have because many wealthy people have, have helped and impacted and ministered to the world. Uh, but many have just hoarded it and, and taken from people. So I, uh, there's a parable I'd like to share with you this morning in, in Luke 16, 19. And it says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate lay a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus at his side. So he called him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. Isn't that an incredible reversal? Lazarus laid at the gate and begged and wished for just scraps of food off the table. And now the rich man has come to the end of life. They both have come to the end. And he's begging for Lazarus to come and just to touch his finger into water and dip it on his tongue. But Abraham replied, son, remember in your lifetime you received your good things. Well, Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us, you, uh, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so they will not come to this place of torment. And Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. You see, there's no lack of people hearing the gospel today. There's a lack of desiring to listen to it or to take it seriously because we're afraid that maybe if we take it seriously, God's going to expect something. He has come to give. I've come to give you life. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes there to them, they will repent. And Jesus, and he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. He was talking about Jesus that was going to rise from the dead. And they wouldn't even believe if, if, if they hear it. So it is a day when we need to seriously consider what's going on. Because the world is in turmoil, but there is a hope and there is a peace. 
In Mark 8, in verse 31, Jesus predicted his death and he said, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And after three days again, he spoke plainly about this, and Peter, he would rise again. And he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But, verse 33, when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And you know, we hold on to life, and we hold on to prosperity, and we hold on to happiness and, and enjoyment and all the things, and we're missing the, the, the ability to meet, you know, full of congregations in church. And But you know, millions and millions of Christians throughout the world cannot meet in churches. And many of them hide out in the forest and the woods and, and sneak into buildings in the night to have church or they would lose their lives. And so he said, don't consider just, you're not considering things of God, but merely human concerns. This world is temporary. We're on a journey to the world, the forever land that we will go to. He went on to say, if he called the crowd to, he, he, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me, for the gospel, will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes to in his father's glory with the holy angels and here's a, a shocking thing uh, there is heaven and there is hell and most people don't want to believe it and lots of preachers don't even preach about it but there is an eternal life and there's eternal suffering in 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 hades in in hell and so what makes it the difference is our decision have we decided to follow jesus and he said you'll forfeit your, uh, that we're willing to, to sacrifice ourselves. And sometimes our desires, our wills, our, our, our conveniences, but that we will inherit what God has in store for us. We learn from the beginning there are two directions of wisdom. The worldly, godly wisdom and the worldly information, or it's called wisdom. God's word has never changed while the world is constantly changing. Matthew 24, 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away but my words will never pass away. And so we're seeing how then shall we live? How then shall we live? 1 John 2 and 14 says, I've written to you, fathers. It's all through the different scriptures. Uh, we see the same uh, teaching as they wrote to different groups and different people wrote. And so we see it again. I've written to you, 1 John 2, 14. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. The riches and the woes of the wealthy. Seek first all these things to seek first the kingdom of God, to get it right, and all these things will be added unto you. Things that will be added unto you. The song says that, that's why I'm leaving it up to you, and I'll, I'll leave with that song. I'm leaving, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a song uh, uh, Donnie Osmond and his sister were singing, but it's a song that has a thought. I'm leaving it all up to you. You decide what you're going to do. Now, do you want my love, or are we through? People are coming to a place in life where we choose the love of God, the sacrifice that he's made. And it may mean that we don't, we may get knocked off of some social platforms uh, because you're sharing too much about God. But he said in the, the words of the song, I'm leaving it up to you. You decide what you're going to do. Now, do you want my love or are we through? Unfortunately, some people are choosing to go the easier way. But, you know, it may not be easy. And the Bible says that the, the righteous shall suffer persecution. And we've had it pretty good in our country, but in many countries, 
they are losing their lives and they're butchered and killed. There are more Christians dying now for their faith than ever in the, in the history of the world. And um, we must choose to pray, to seek God, to surrender, to give, to be like Laterno, where he took the wealth that he had to bless others, to help others, and uh, impacted the world. And God kept giving him more ideas and more direction. And uh, so the song says, I'm leaving it up to you. You decide what you're going to do. Now, do you want my love or are we through? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Your love, you said you love us so much that you sent your son into this world to die, that we might have life. Thank you, Lord, that as we receive the gift, we acknowledge that we are sinful. We cannot make it on our own. Doesn't matter how much money or how much fame or how much ability, or how much talent. Um, we still, the second we die, it's over. There's nothing more we can do. But Lord, we thank you that we come to you before and you prepared a place for us. And you said that not to let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, but I, I prepared a, a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. And Lord, we thank you that that promises to us as we believe. We can be Lazarus, who maybe didn't have things very good, but was rejoicing in eternity, or the rich one man that was crying out, as we was desperate and thirsty. Or we think of the rich young man that came. He said, what must I do? And he's done all the things right. But he wasn't willing to take the wealth and the goods that he had to share with others. And God, I know that you're not telling us just to give everything away. But you said, when we see a need and have the ability to meet it, that we need to meet it. And Lord, I pray that you, you'll bless everyone. Bless people today with the truth that you love them and you gave your life for them. And our hope for eternity is in through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And bless people that as they pray for others, ones that are suffering. And we think of uh, a little boy that is uh, going through treatments for her cancer and surgery. And we just pray this morning for that family. That God, you just touch them and, and bless them. And that your miracle working power would be there as well. Father, we just thank you that you are still the God who hears our prayers. And you're not too busy. Uh, you're listening. And thank you, Lord, as people are praying today, whatever their needs are, as they listen over on, on YouTube, Lord, whatever their needs may be, we lift them up in prayer today. God, reach out and touch them. Give hope, encouragement, peace, joy, love, faith, and trust. And we just give you praise for this now. Bless us now. And, and Lord, we thank you that we can even continue to share the message uh, over the over the internet and Lord as we go on to zoom zoom service tomorrow that we can still see each other Bless all the churches across our land and Lord let there be peace on earth and we pray against this virus this this attack of, of Sickness we just speak death to it and life to the healing and Lord give our doctors our, our politicians everyone that's involved wisdom guidance in your strength and answers to prayer and we'll give you praise for this. We can give you the glory, Lord, because we will see that you have touched us. We just give you thanks now in Jesus' name.